let's take our Bibles then and we'll turn over to Revelation chapter 17. And what we might do, we might just pick through some different uh, scriptures uh, to start with and consider those and um, then we'll have a look at some photos and I'll take you on tour. Revelation in chapter 17. In the first verse we read, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither and I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made, made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet coloured beast full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Amen. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet colour and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery. Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Of course, this is the uh, revised Roman Empire. Um, verse number eight. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is and here is the mind which hath wisdom the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth and there are seven kings five are fallen and one is and the other is not yet come and when he cometh he must continue a short space it's a lot to absorb, isn't it? A woman sitting on a beast, uh, represented also by a, a city of seven hills, the seven-headed beast, the seven mountains that the woman, uh, that the uh, uh, city is uh, is on there. Verse number twelve, and the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings. Uh, those of you who are a little bit familiar with prophecy would understand the ten kings which will give their authority to the Antichrist during the time of the tribulation. And uh, uh, during that time, this uh, ten nation confederacy will allow their power to be absorbed by the Antichrist, uh, who ultimately will uh, turn against the Lord Jesus as they march on Jerusalem in the end times. Last week we looked at the subject briefly of Armageddon and uh, saw the place but saw the, uh, the Bible truth that Christ will come and decisively end all uh, of the ungodliness of men and nations. And so here we have a religious system on riding on the back of a political system uh, which borrows the power of nations. Uh, the beast sits on the waters, we read. Uh, the waters represent, as the scriptures tell us, uh, peoples and nations and tongues. And so uh, the waters represent the multiplicity of nations that are included there uh, of this... Um, religious and political um, phenomenon. Uh, the revised Roman Empire, and uh, we would see that very clearly in Rome. I want you to turn over to Revelation chapter 18. <clears throat> Actually, just before that, we'll get to chapter 17 and verse number 18. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. 
that's the city. And then the, um, the next portion there as Babylon is destroyed. Verse number 3, For all nations have drunken the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. So when God judges uh, mystery Babylon here, this is what happens. Verse 4, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. So God brings judgment. This religious and political establishment is judged of God. Verse Number 11, we read of the response of the world when they see this judgment taking place at the end of the, of the tribulation there. Verse 11, And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones, and of pearls and fine linen, and purple and sink and scarlet and old thyene wood, in all manner of vessels of ivory, and in all manner of vessels of most precious wood, and of brass, and iron, and marble, and cinnamon, and odors, and ointments, and frankincense, and wine, and oil, and fine flour, and wheat, and beasts, and sheep, and horses, and chariots, and slaves, and souls of men. These were the things she traded in. All of those things. There's an interesting progression there. And so the challenge there, verse number 18, we read, They cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour she is made desolate. Rejoice! over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. Why don't we pray, shall we? Lord, we thank you that our God is the victor still. And Lord, we thank you that you are faithful in dealing uh, with those who oppose you. And Lord, we're thankful that we can uh, read and uh, understand the scriptures today. We pray that you'd encourage us as we consider these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Come out of her, my people. That's the challenge that's given in the passage we've just read. It's a challenge for those who were saved during the tribulation period. Uh, a, uh, a position of separation from a, um, uh, a machine that is uh, uh, opposed to God. I want you to consider with me um, some thoughts about Roman Catholicism tonight as we consider that. Um, I have mentioned to you that uh, when we were in Israel, one of the things that frustrated me was that everywhere we went there was most, uh, most often a Catholic church built over every site. This is right around the corner from the, um, uh, the, uh, the tomb. And uh, so here we have a Catholic church. We went in and visited there. There was another Catholic church not far from this one. We went inside and we actually, there was about 20 of us or something. We just got together. There was fantastic acoustics. So we sang a hymn in there. There was nobody else there. We gathered there. Uh, used their acoustics and went on our way. But as much as we did that, there's something frustrating about the reality that there's a place that stands for a false gospel and presents Christ falsely. Um, I know that uh, you guys are fam familiar with the truths that we have there uh, in the scriptures as they stand as distinct from the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. And they, they present a gospel of Salvation by works and uh, earning favor with God, merit with God by what you do. Uh, and again, we've, uh, through some of the, the different uh, photos we've seen, we've, uh, we've visited 
some of the Catholic churches over Peter's uh, old home. Uh, we've visited in different other places. It seems that everywhere we went there was a Catholic church. I love architecture. I enjoyed the architecture of these places. But uh, as much as we would go into the, these um, buildings and, and uh, wonder at the handiwork of men, there was always a great frustration, uh, even a defilement there, as you recognize the, um, the false teachings of the false churches and the false church. Well, we left and we went to Greece. And uh, in Greece, you have primarily the Orthodox Church and the Orthodox Church is simply the Eastern arm of, uh, of the same thing. They, they're the, um, the same in principle to all that Catholicism stands for. Now, they would argue uh, against that statement, but the reality is they're, they're born in the same uh, uh, principle and uh, hold to the same realities or concepts of, uh, of how we can be uh, reunited with God. So we went to Athens and um, uh, we were right in the center of Athens on one of the main pedestrian streets is where, where our hotel was. And uh, we were literally one block up from the church. And it was good because uh, uh, Larice was going out and uh, it was like, how do we get home? Well, we're just up from the church. Uh, and we went around the block twice and, oh, there's the church. And we, we were walking up the street and then realized that's a different church. And, you know, on every corner there was a, there was a different church. Everywhere you go around there, they, there were churches. You could see the next church from the last church. Uh, they were so uh, often um, around us. Um, different, yeah, different churches on different places. Uh, this church is on the, on the walk. You're, we're headed up to uh, the, um, the Pantheon there in, in Athens. But um, I wanted you to see up there in the distance the highest hill in the area and uh, there is a convent up the top of there with a church, uh, another church, and uh, they get the highest peak. But they also have a wonderful restaurant in the old convent. It's not, not functional anymore, so they have a wonderful restaurant there. And uh, if you ever get to go there, this is from there, and it actually looks out over the... Uh, um, uh, over the uh, Mediterranean there and wonderful night view, although it was absolutely freezing. Um, that, was, uh, that was good. So next time you're in Athens, drop in there. You've got to go to that place. That's, uh, that's my um, advice. Um, up, uh, up the street again, different street. Um, now we're, um, we're in one of the Greek islands and uh, we've got them there again. You've got the, um, where's this place called? There you go, Santorini. Um, the, the blue roofs um, are seen everywhere, but it's, uh, it's the same realities, which I'd never really thought of it before, but that's what Santorini was known for until we got there. And I went, this is just churches that are teaching false, false ways of salvation. And it begins to frustrate you as you go through all of these things. Uh, I had in my head where this was. Where is this? We've gone to the next place. No, past there. Oh, anyway. Um, that's where it is. Wherever the hill was. Montenegro, sorry. Um, there's an old church up, up here. This, this place had um, a wall right around the entire city. Um, pretty amazing, the... Uh, the hill was incredible. It was walled, but again, it's made of churches and a, a tiny little city about 600 years old and everywhere you look there was churches. Uh, this, is, um, this is where we ended up on, on the end of the cruise. Where is that? There, Trieste. We're in, into the top corner of, uh, of Italy there and we're back to Catholic churches. And everywhere you look, there are Catholic churches. We, we went through a whole bunch of these places and uh, looked at different places. And again, uh, they're amazing. 
the architecture was amazing. Um, I, I couldn't help myself. I had to go in and see what was there. And uh, then I got there and literally my stomach was turned in very many of them. As you see, the rejection of Christ the Saviour and the elevation of man and um, the glory of men and all those things. Uh, you've heard of St. Nick. Um, you might remember him at Christmas time. Um, well, he has his own basilica there. there he's got his, uh, his picture too uh, for him. Um, <clears throat> into the basilica, um, St. Nicholas's uh, Basilica. We went in there. It is massive. It is a, an enormous building. And uh, some of these things, great cathedrals that are built uh, to house many individuals and all of this to purport a false gospel. Enemies of the truth. Enemies of the gospel. Uh, the uh, forward movement of paganism in its presentation as it presents itself as godliness. Um, I think this is, yep, this is into Venice and uh, you've, you've got the same things coming up uh, and then we're into Rome and um, everywhere you look there is another church, another church. That was the one that they suggested uh, it was built over where uh, the Apostle Paul was imprisoned when he was there in Rome. Uh, in just around the corner from the, uh, the Colosseum. And uh, uh, you'll notice the, the church is there, but as you go up the hill, uh, the hill is significant there because this is a central hill there in Rome. Uh, that was Palantino Hill. And uh, from Palantino Hill, you go up there and that's, uh, you can look out over the entire city from Palantino Hill. Uh, you can actually look out to the Colosseum and uh, all of the, um, the central attractions to us uh, that are around the area there. But I want you to notice these different hills here around town. This is, in fact, the seven hills that the scripture refers to. Uh, the seven mountains on which the city is built, uh, it is known as the city of seven hills, Rome. And just right ac across the river there is, um, is where, uh, well, we'll get there in just a moment, uh, the seven hills again. Um, <clears throat> scripture says in Revelation 17, 9, we read it earlier, the seven heads, that is the seven heads of the beast that the woman rides on, are the seven hills, or seven mountains on which the woman sits. Uh, so we, we have the woman representing the religious uh, emphasis, sitting on the beast which re represents the political emphasis. And uh, here they are uh, coming and doing their thing. The woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Of course, the beasts of... Um, uh, of the book of Daniel uh, represent uh, the different kingdoms and we see the, the kingdoms uh, of Babylon, the first kingdom that he represented, the kingdom that was in power at the time of Daniel. Uh, they were taken over by uh, the Medes and the Persians. They were taken over by the Grecians and they were taken over by the Romans. Political empires that ruled the world uh, and ruled over Israel. Uh, the Roman Empire was not necessarily taken over. It blended into a religious empire, which continued on from there. And so uh, we went for a trip around Vatican City. Now, this is, this is the, the map of the Vatican. Uh, there's the walls of the Vatican City. Nothing glamorous from the outside. It was a rainy old day when we got there. You can see it all just on the inside there. But you, um, here is a, a, a little, they, they give you something to comprehend where you're at. You actually enter uh, over on this side here and you can go in and you can go through these buildings if you go on a tour through the Vatican. 
And uh, when we were going there, it was like, shall we go to the Vatican? No, let's not go to the Vatican. The Vatican's, um, uh, we're opposed to everything that the Vatican stands for. But then again, it is, it's, it's something uh, for to see and to understand. So it was actually one of the things that we wanted to go and see. And we ended up, we decided we'd go on a tour of the Vatican. Um, this circular part there, that's called the square, um, as you would uh, have it. And the entrance there, uh, you, you can go through the Vatican City here. Um, it's only a very small portion of land. It, it is, uh, is its own uh, country. It, it has its own postcode. It, it uh, has its own um, uh, mail system. Uh, but it's built around the church. Uh, this is St. Peter's Cathedral there. So we went on the walk through these, uh, these buildings here. Of course, you, you get to see some of the wonders of the architecture of men and the very best that men can do. Mystery, Babylon the Great. The great nation which has established herself over the world. Uh, the world is the emphasis. Uh, Rome has an endeavour to control the world. Uh, the, the word Catholic means universal and emphasises the agenda that Rome is not interested in just those few acres on which she's settled. She's not interested in simply the 800 people who are actually, uh, uh, who live on site there at the Vatican, um, citizens of the country. Rome wants the world. Aren't you thankful that the one who has been appointed as the defender of the faith, he's, uh, he's like this, you can see from that photo, can't you, with the Pope. Um, the whole world is what they're after. It doesn't matter who they are or what religion they're from. We can see that the world is being brought under the hand of Catholicism. All the religions of the world are, are invited to join her. Yes, the woman riding the beast. And... Uh, You've got there the religious powers riding on the back of the political force. In Revelation 18, we read some of the, uh, the things that she traded in. She has glorified herself and lived deliciously, the scripture said. <clears throat> but I want you to notice there some of the things that she made merchandise of. The merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls and fine, um, uh, these things there. Uh, the, the wood, brass, iron and marble, we, we missed those there. The wood, the brass, the iron and the marble, those things are things, they're base elements. Uh, they're the, um, uh, the basis of commerce and trade. Uh, Rome is one of the richest places in the world, is it not? And uh, they, they have the challenge that every, every Catholic has to pay their way. Uh, that's, that's something that they put forward. Um, they go into some of the specialties that we can enjoy, the cinnamon and odours, the ointments and the frankincense. Wow, that's living it up when we get to these things. They get down to basic necessities and the basic sustenance of man. That's the wine and oil, the fine flour and the wheat and the beasts and the sheep. Uh, by these things you have control of people, control of nations. I want you to notice the next thing that, uh, that she makes merchandise of. The horses and chariots and slaves and blood of saints. Um, the uh, horses and chariots and slaves... Uh, identifies a uh, military machine that, uh, that deals in militia. And then you see the 
the end of all the merchandise there and it says, and of the souls of men. Isn't it a terrible thing that the souls of men are made merchandise? That people see viable trade in the souls of men, caring nothing for the individual, but what they can get from the individual. And they can trade those things away. We emphasize then the, uh, what the scripture says of her, she has glorified herself and lived deliciously. I want you to just uh, walk with me through what the Bible calls that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scar scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Uh, here we've got uh, the, the blood of the martyrs there, as Wycliffe said as he was burned at the stake, Lord, open thou the King of England's eyes. Let's go for a walk as we step in. Do you know, you could go through the... Um, Uh, uh, through, through the halls that they have here and you, you're going to find uh, more artefacts you, than you'll find in a general museum. Uh, all different kinds of artefacts. That's a ceiling, a roof. Um, rooms of just uh, amazing um, wealth. All of these things put together just because they can. Uh, some of the greatest collections in the world. You go down the hall here, and this hall is, uh, uh, it's got all uh, woven um, cloths on the side there and on the ceiling as well, uh, 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 from the floor to the ceiling. Uh, we've got all of these uh, things. Um, you go through there, you'll be in stitches. Uh, ha ha, from beginning to end. Um, it's said that in some of, some of these works, um, a great many of them actually have gold woven in, uh, uh, into the works that are there. And uh, they, simply because they can. The, the gold is there. The wealth that is uh, demonstrated there. I have a friend that was just, uh, just in Rome after we were there. I spoke with her uh, just recently, a couple of weeks ago, and um, she, we, she was talking about everything she saw there, um, the Pope's home. And uh, she doesn't claim to be a believer. If I'm correct, I think she is a Catholic. And her... Um, bewilderment when she spoke with me was I, I just couldn't believe that they could put forward such outward demonstration of wealth and then care nothing for the the needy of the world in in real terms um, the the challenge that was there she she was um, she was quite taken back and uh, so were we, but at least we had perspective there. The, the perspective we have is this. Uh, she's called in the scriptures the great whore. A whore is a, uh, a fill-in for the bride. It's a false bride. And the Bible speaks of her as the great whore that sits upon many waters. Uh, a misrepresentation of the Bride of Christ. Of course, the Bride of Christ is the Church of Jesus Christ. And uh, she is a misrepresentation. Now, when we were in Athens, we see this guy here. He rode up on his bike just in front of us as we were walking through the town square there. And um, he, he had, a, oops, he had a, a, a flag on the back of his bike. And he, he, was, uh, he was on a mission, you could see that. And... Uh, he jumped off his bike and he almost ran up the stairs there and got up the top and uh, held up his prize. It was the glorification of Mary. And uh, he was calling the city uh, to worship their God, uh, to, to um, lord and adore Mary. Uh, what, a, what a sad concept that is. It's a mis 
representation of what the church ought to stand for, uh, the glory of Christ. Um, this is a challenge that I found to Catholics, to go to Mass and refrain from servile work on Sundays and holy days. That's not a bad concept, uh, but it's not a law of God. Um, uh, to go to confession at least once a year. Oh, that's where they get it from. They're actually taught. You have to go once a year, uh, maybe at Lent or Easter. A lot of people will go there. And uh, the good Catholic goes to church once a year because he's fulfilling his duty. He feels it is something that he must do. And he feels that because that's what they teach him. Uh, to receive the Eucharist um, or... They have their, um, um, as it were, the Lord's Supper, but it's not the Lord's. Uh, at least once a year during the Easter season. So they're going to come and they're going to do these things with the, uh, uh, the objective of having their sins dealt with. The, to observe days of fasting and abstinence, uh, to provide for the needs of the church according to one's abilities and station in life and to obey the marriage laws of the church. Um, all it is is a bunch of laws about how to build what they have. Now, this one's not a photo that we took because uh, I wasn't up there. But um, we couldn't capture it all in once. Once we got uh, out the doors, we said, shall we bother going to the cathedral? I mean, we've been to a gazillion cathedrals now, now, feel with me. We'd, we'd literally been to dozens and dozens of churches and cathedrals. And on more than one of them, I'd left feeling physically ill because you see just blasphemy there. Um, and uh, the, the Lord overthrown. And uh, I said to Larissa, I really can't be bothered. Like, uh, why bother going in there? And then we said, well, hey... Um, we're here once, we might as well go and have a look. And so we, we went for the long hike around into, uh, into the square here and then we saw the line. Uh, there is a gazillion people lined up to go in and it, it was going to take us a good amount of time. And so we, uh, we weaved and, and eventually got through the, um, the line to get into... St. Peter's Cathedral. Uh, that's looking out. Um, there you've got some clowns. No, that's not clowns. They're actually the Royal Guard there. Um, and then you step into St. Peter's Cathedral. <clears throat> the photos don't do it justice, but it is the largest church in the world. They, they have measurements and they, they state that um, and glory in it. And every inch of the building is about a declaration of wealth, of the glory of man, and uh, of the church's right to bring people to God. Everywhere you look, there's challenges of blasphemy and uh, the exaltation of Peter and uh, uh, of man. This is all in one uh, church building here. It's, it's got nooks and crannies that come off every, every corner. Everywhere you look, there is uh, the glory of Peter. Uh, again, the magnitude of the place, uh, you can hardly overstate it. Look at this. Is, there was a um, service going on down the front of the building there. You can hardly see the people uh, compared to the, the size uh, of the height of the building there, of course, their uh, sun worship being central there, uh, all of those things. These are, these are not separate rooms. This is all one, uh, one building. The glory of men. Uh, the Bible said she had on her the names of blasphemy. Uh, the Bible calls her the mother of harlots. Uh, a misrepresentation of the bride of Christ, something that stands in to take place of the bride of Christ. Uh, Peter is seen with the keys uh, as being the one who can offer eternal salvation. That's how they would present that. Um, although our Lord alone 
offers eternal salvation uh, to men. Uh, the entire time we were in there, you are literally wowed by the magnitude of the place, but you're also sickened by the blasphemy that's there. The challenge for people in that tribulation time is, come out of her, my people. Those who are saved are to come out. Why? Because God is just about to judge her. We saw last week the reality of Christ coming and uh, dealing with the world uh, at the time of Armageddon, the, uh, the final judgment when the Lord Jesus returns to earth. Uh, he's going to come down and he's going to bring judgment on this religious institution. I want to ask you a question. Is all religion good? Is all religion beneficial? Should we say of somebody, well, they don't really believe like I do, but at least they're going to church. No, 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 that's not a good thing. Going to church is not a good thing. If the church does not teach the word of God, going to church is a negative thing. We don't want people to go and uh, be taught uh, lies, uh, to have Christ misrepresented, undermined, and the gospel uh, spoiled and changed. Uh, what a... Uh, what a lie is being presented uh, in the, uh, the name of religion as the devil endeavours to bring souls to hell. This is the great promotion of the Pope. Uh, we had a, a guide that took us through the buildings earlier and he talked about the Pope, the Pope, the Pope, the Pope, the Pope. So much, we were like, I can't deal with this anymore. And literally, uh, I had had, had it uh, up to my eyeballs. And uh, it was all about the Pope. Of course, the word Pope is just Papa, Father, uh, responding to his recognition as being Holy Father. Uh, they're the words that Jesus spoke of our Father, which art in heaven, Holy Father. Uh, that's the name by which God alone should be recognized. Uh, he is our Holy Father. And these have misrepresented men and put them in the shoes of God and uh, taken his place and taken his worship and taken his honor. Come out of her, my people. A statement for future believers, but a reality for us here today. Don't pretend that lies are okay. We should not uh, endeavor to walk with her or in any way uh, to, um, to suggest that there is any benefit from these things. But to uh, name the truth, uh, to recognize the word of God as the final and only truth. In verse number 7 of chapter 19, we read, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to Him, Christ. For the marriage of the Lamb is come and His wife has made herself ready. A great contrast is established there. From this one, the false bride. And then the bride of Christ is brought to the fore. And there is the great marriage in heaven, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, that we read of there in verse number 9. It's a wonderful um, reality of what's coming in the future. We haven't done justice to the passages that are presented here. We haven't had an exposition or a biblical comparison of these things. But perhaps my thought was, as we see all that is being uh, put forwards to the world just to recognize that these things are not in, in keeping with the truths of the Word of God. The one that deals in commerce 
that deals with the basic necessities of men to control, that deals in military might and power, and that deals in the souls of men, is a force to be reckoned with, but also one to be recognised, that this is not a representative of God. This one, clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, this one will have her final hour and be brought down by God himself in judgment. For us, we rejoice in the one who is King of kings and Lord of lords. We make sure we give him all worship and praise. Him, not the preacher, not the priest, not any one that might take his place in being named as father, him alone, he deserves the worship. I was thinking about the placement of a message on this, uh, of this tone and my wife asked me about it and I said, well, it is Father's Day and they represent themselves as uh, recognising the Holy Father, the Pope. And uh, so... There he goes. Uh, they have their glory today and ultimately they put forth the concept that that man can forgive sins. But ultimately they will have their end. Again the scripture there, come out of her my people that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. Don't be fooled by everything that is called church that it is actually of God or that it is a representative of God. That is just a lie. All right, why don't we go to the Lord in prayer. We are thankful, Lord, for, uh, for who Christ is. We're thankful for the truth of your word. And Lord, we know that there are many today who are uh, in, involved in worship, uh, involved in church, uh, who go through the whole church system and maybe through their whole lives thinking that there is hope and security because they're following and learning about Jesus and yet they've been taught a lie, taught that works is the basis of salvation, taught that men might stand in the place of God. And Lord, uh, we're thankful that your word brings us to the truth, that we can know God directly and come to you uh, through the one and only go-between, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're thankful for who he is. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.